So uh, welcome to Iran Book Show, and today we're going to be interviewing uh, Ankar Gatte, who's the uh, chief content officer at the Ayn Rand Institute, a philosopher, and we're going to be talking about free will. I get tons and tons of questions about free will uh, all the time on on the show, on uh, when I'm when I'm out uh, giving speeches, and uh, you know I do my best to answer them. But today we've got an expert who is uh, we're going to try to we're going to try to cover the topic as much as we can. So thank you, Ankar, for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me. Sure. So I thought we'd start with um, what Ayn Rand's unique view of free will is, uh, because otherwise we're kind of we're talking about something that a lot of people don't even understand what it is. So, so what what is what is free will, and what in in to what extent is Ayn Rand's view of free will from the context of the history of philosophy different or unique? Um, so I think her view is unique in a lot of ways. But the basic phenomenon everyone's familiar with, so what, what Ayn Rand says and what you get in objectivism is the phenomenon is it's self-evident. You, and what the phenomenon is, is you make choices. And that's what free will is. You make choices. And choices means you're selecting between alternatives. And that means more than one. You could select A or B or C or D. And that everybody's familiar with, which is why the people who say there's no such thing as free will say there's an illusion of free will. So that you have choices, but you don't really have choices. That's what it means. Um, and objectivism says you have choices, and there are choices. So, but to conceptualize fully the phenomenon that you're aware of, and that you're aware of internally, or objectivism will put it introspectively, that's what's difficult. And what objectivism says about how to conceptualize it is in various ways uh, distinctive, I think. So, uh, but it, what it takes seriously is that the phenomenon of choice and says it's real and is not to be explained away as an illusion. And, it's, and the validation of that or the proof of that is, is purely introspective? Yeah, yeah, the evidence for it is introspective. You make choices and you're aware of the fact of making choices because it's you making the choice. Uh, you got up in the morning and decided what to wear, what to eat, what you're going to do in the day. If you go to work, what are you going to start working on? You constantly are selecting among alternatives, which means you're making choices. And you know, you're the one making it. So it, the evidence is introspective. What objectivism also says you can find some other people in philosophy who say this, but objectivism really stresses, and I think gets how fundamental free will is. It's that it's incoherent to view yourself as not having free will. And it's incoherent. Most people think of it as, well, without free will, there won't be good and evil. There's not moral choices. You can't fault someone, blame someone, which is also interesting. It's always in the negative. You can't fault them, blame them. You also can't praise them and say they did something good. That's true, but not fundamental from objectivism point of view, because it's deeper. Um, issues about choice first surface or surface um, in a crucial way in regard to the control you have over your mind. And a determinist has to say that you're out of control. You're not in control. Something external to you and antecedent to you is in control, whether it's put nature or nurture, and there's all kinds of variations of what in nature is determining you, or what about your nurture, your physiology, your genetics is determining you. In the religious view, it's God's really in control, not you. So there's a whole strain in religions of determinism. Something else is in control, you're not. If you take that really seriously, it means you're not in control of your mind or of your thinking. Yeah. Um, and if that's true, then what you're talking about, you have no control over. Why do you think you're right and somebody else is wrong? You're determined to think and say what you're saying. He's determined to think and say what he's saying. Why do you have a perspective that you're right, he's wrong? Haven't you ever been wrong before? Haven't there been cases where someone else is right? You're so, and you're you're fundamentally out of control. So it's I believe what I believe because of, and I don't. And so, and someone like because uh, there, there are most people today are determinists. Yeah. 
Yeah. Most people in science are determinists. Most people are even arguing about morality. Most people are determinists. So take someone like Sam Harris, who on on many moral issues is good. On issues about Islam and religion is good, but he has a view that. Free will, there's no such thing. There's not even the illusion of free will is, is his view. And here's one way he put it. So here's, uh, I've read his book on free will. Here's one excerpt. So he gives that supposedly you select among alternatives, but you don't really. You are struggling to save money, but you're also tempted to buy a new computer. Where is the freedom when one of these opposing desires inexplicably yeah. triumphs over its rivals? And he has to say it's inexplicable because yep. if, if they're really scientific, they have to say, I don't know what determines people. We can't tell you. I can't tell you what somebody's going to do. I can't even like, come close to telling what someone's going to do. But I know he's determined. I don't know what he's determined by. If it's because his mother breastfed him or didn't breastfeed him or what. I mean, what combination of things results in his action now? So it's inexplicable. Now, that's how Harris describes actions. He would never describe his thinking like that. It's, um, I'm trying to decide, should I be religious or should I be secular? Where is the freedom on one of these it's ideas? It's inexplicable. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's so, so what, what objectivism says is, if there was no such thing as free will, there's no such thing as knowledge, there's no such thing as anybody having a perspective of, I'm have arrived at the truth, you've made an error, you need to correct, which means you need to make choices. You're in control of your mind. Make choices to come to see, oh yeah, that's a wrong view, this is the right view. If you don't have that control, the distinction of truth and falsehood goes away, and all knowledge goes away, including knowledge that determinism is true. So it's in it's self-refuting, it's incoherent in a deep way, objectively. So, so it seems, that doesn't seem that hard. Why doesn't Sam Harris, somebody like Sam Harris, not get the self-refuting part of it? Um, think? I think if you push them, they start to feel and they start to get uncomfortable. Um, it's not, so I said, there's some other places in philosophy where you can find someone making an argument like this, but it's not widespread. It's not, if you take a, a first year class where free will is off, I mean, intro to philosophy where free will is often a topic, it likely won't come up this, this kind of issue and problem with determinism. So objectivism really stresses that, I mean, it calls it the contradiction of determinism, that there's some a, a fundamental problem in it. And it's how you know that, not that, that you know that free will is a fact, you know that introspectively, but it's, it's an inescapable fact. And the inescapable is, if you try to deny it and, and try to be a determinant, you can't do it. Um, now, in that sense, is it an axiom? Yes. So, objective and it's a starting point, not for all knowledge. So, axioms are defining starting points, and the basic axioms in objectivism are starting points for all knowledge. Uh, the first of which is, existence exists. What is, is. There is something. And all knowledge is the exploration of what exists. So it, it's the starting point, and all knowledge just is a further exploration of the things that exist. But the starting point is you're aware of something. You're aware of existence. So that's an axiom for all knowledge. For um, free will, it says it's an axiom for conceptual knowledge. So knowledge or awareness of reality begins with uh, you being aware in a sensory perceptual way, using your eyes, your ears, you hear stuff, you see stuff, that does not involve free will. Um, when you start to think and construct arguments and draw conclusions, uh, is religion right or is it wrong? To take something we were talking about before. Um, <clears throat> how should I solve, try to solve this problem at work? You're now not just using your eyes and ears, and you're using your mind, you're thinking, and there it's, you're able to do that because you have this kind of control over your mind. And that is, you couldn't even think about, like, how should I attack this problem? What should I believe? What is true? What If you didn't have that kind of control over your mind, you knew it, because you're exercising that control. So it's an axiom in regard to conceptual knowledge, to thinking. Okay. Um, from objectivism's point of view.
Of course, one of the big issues that comes up with free will is, is the idea that if, it ex if, if we have free will, it somehow violates, uh, you know, causality, the law of causality or the, um, you know, how does, how does one deal with, with the whole causality issue? Um, I think there's a, a couple of things at least that one really has to uh, take seriously. So one is um, the issue of materialism. And most people today, including most scientists, are materialists. Um, not certainly not all, but it's it's the dominant force, and certainly in philosophy, it's the dominant force today or dominant viewpoint. And materialism is the view that reality is ultimately made up of matter. It sometimes will put matter in motion. It's the kind of view bequeathed to the West as a result of the scientific revolution um, of the Newtonian worldview that everything is just matter and it was sometimes we put atoms or whatever in motion and that's how we have to look at everything and that's replacing idealism so the two major you can call these metaphysical views because they're about the fundamental nature of reality the older view was idealism which says some kind of mind or consciousness is really at the root and heart of reality and in control of everything and everything boils down to explaining it by reference to what a mind or consciousness is doing. I mean, again, in Western thought, yeah. that view comes predominantly, though not exclusively, from religion. Uh, it's God's conscience, and he's behind everything. Yeah. And when you say he's behind everything, that's meant literally. He's behind everything. He's yeah. And controlled. then they have the problem of free will as well, and in integrating free will with the idea of a, of a consciousness that's in control of everything. And the yes. massive writings in Christianity, Judaism, about trying to solve the problem of free will. And yeah, and I mean, if you think of God as he's omniscient, he's all powerful, he's all good, um, he, so he knows the future, yeah. and, and there's all kinds of issues about that about well isn't everything determined he knows what's going to happen which means you don't you're not selecting among alternatives it's already he knows what you're going to select there's no real selection going on so yeah so it, it's it is a huge conundrum for a religious worldview um but it but part of what happened then is free will became associated with idealism that when we're talking, and, and if you think of God as, even if mankind don't possess free will, God usually is thought of, because it's a constraint. If he's not free, then he's constrained. Like, what's constraining him if he's the ultimate source of reality? So he's unconstrained, he's unlimited. That came to mean, be associated with that, what it's like to be free. Um, so free will got more and more pushed on the side of a mystical worldview, a world without identity. He, that's part of what it meant. He's unlimited. He's infinite. He's unconstrained. He's not, I mean, this guy, idea that A is A and things have a nature. Yeah, that's for us, but not for God. He's beyond that. Um, and free will got to be pushed on that side. And then if you're talking, well, no, if we don't believe in miracles, and a will controlling everything and all of reality, then, and, and the scientific worldview is pushing against that. It became, no, we're, we're, gonna, we're tossing out the idea of, um, of a God in control of everything. It's natural forces. That then came to be seen as, well, it's all material forces. And you got this kind of view that the free will is on the side of the supernatural, of mysticism, of the religion that we're discarding. And determinism then is on the side of science, and particularly if it's material. And the person who really cemented that that's, yeah, that's the way to look at the world is Kant. Um, and, I mean, people familiar with Ayn Rand and objectivism will know that she blames him for a lot, but not without reason. Um, it this he put that basically reality has a dual nature. So he's a he's Plato in a new, more modern form. 
Plato divided the world into there's two realms, uh, the world of abstractions of forms and this world that's partly unreal, partly contradictory. Kant has that kind of division in a different form. And he says there's a phenomenal world and a noumenal world. And the phenomenal world is the world of science. I mean, suppose it's, it's a world created by the human mind. It's where science applies. It's essentially material. It's deterministic. But in this other world, determinism and causality doesn't apply. And he says, well, and human beings have a kind of dual nature. They're part phenomenal, part noumenal. So from one perspective, we look at human beings and say they're determined. From another, more sophisticated, mystical, religious perspective and, and moral perspective, Kant will add. No, there's some kind of free will in a noumenal world. We can't explain it. We don't know anything about the noumenal world. We can't really say there is such a world. But we have to assume and act as though there is. And you get the key. That's your choice. Side with science, the material, and be a determinist. Or no, try to accept free will, morality, and be a mystic. And everyone operates with that and they make one choice or the other. Some will say the more religionist, the more mystical will say, no, there's got to be something to free will. So I guess science doesn't tell you everything and, and we can't go by science and reason everywhere. Or else you get the person like Harris who's thinking, no, but I am scientific, I am rational. And that means I need to be a materialist and a determinist. So what would be the objectivist perspective? So we have so there, materialism and idealism on both sides. What what does objectivism add? Both are wrong. Yep. So objectivism in all kinds of different places, and here's another example, says your existing categories are not exhausted, and if you treat them as exhaustive, as if you have to choose materialism or idealism, you're going to run into all kinds of problems and dead ends, and it's going to be a complete disaster, which is what I think happens in regard to this. So, and Ayn Rand early on was asked, uh, I mean, th this is the sort of the story of, she was asked, are you a materialist or an idealist? And she's very, I mean, as you know, she's very pro-science, she's yeah. pro-reason, so she answered a materialist, I guess. And then she stepped back and said, like, wait a minute, why, why are these the two choices? And that's so typical of her thinking yep. that it's um, and and you can feel like she's so independent. So you can feel like you're boxing me in. And why are these the boxes? <clears throat> um, and so her view is, yes, there is such a thing as matter. Science is a vast accumulation of knowledge. She's so pro the scientific revolution and everything that flows out of that, including industry, technology. Um, aspects of capitalism I mean, it's really industrial capitalism. I mean, the, 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 the industrial revolution and everything it brings depends on science. Yep. It showcases the tremendous value and knowledge acquired by science. So she's so on that side. Um, but there's also mind and consciousness. And you don't have, in accepting all of that, you don't have to pretend these things don't exist or they're an illusion or they're supernatural. So she views, and this is, I mean, this is why she put herself in the Aristotelian tradition. Aristotle is really the only philosopher in his tradition who views the mind as real and natural. So Plato's the view of the mind is real and it's supernatural. It's part of another dimension. It's implanted in you. This is how you get in Christianity the religious view that soul is implanted in you from another dimension. That's all in Plato. Yeah. Um, and Aristotle's the, no, there's not two no dimensions, but he doesn't throw out soul or mind or consciousness in throwing out the other dimension. That's what's so revolutionary in his thought and so distinctive in his thought. And why the way, to say that Aristotle is the father of the West, this is the basic metaphysical reason, because everything good about the West comes from a view that the mind is real but natural, operating in a natural world that is knowable, governed by identity, 
discoverable by science. I mean, Aristotle is the first scientist in the in a real meaning of that term. I mean, Einstein called him the first intellectual. And it's you get this view that the mind's powerful, natural, capable of knowing the world, and that's what objectivism says. And so, in regard to free will, its view is the a human mind, and maybe some of the other higher animals, that's a more scientific question, but we know our own minds and, and that it's operation. The human mind operates by choices, which means it's you as a human being, you as an entity are making choices. You make them all through the day, um, every day. It's you choosing. You're the cause. The effect is what you select. And that there, one form of causality is antecedent factors. Or, and, and, and I mean, Newton, and, and that, it, that he's understanding the solar system, that they can the predict ball, when a, Kind of the billiard ball. View. Yeah, though so it's, it's more sophisticated in the end. Than bill, but yeah, it, it's, there's antecedent factors. This is what we're on. So we can predict the tides, and we can predict when a Halley's Comet is going to come back. And, all, and it was, I mean, astonishing that they can do this. That's one form of causality, but it doesn't exhaust every form of causality. It's not all by antecedent material forces. And even in science, when they start discovering different kinds of forces, electromagnetism and so on, they needed a much more sophisticated view than the billiard ball yep. view. Um, and even in, I mean, if you get in science today, when they get to the level of quantum mechanics, they'll say, no, it's not all antecedent factors, it's not all deterministic, and so on. So they're ready to accept that in science. But they're, and Harris, I mean, Harris is an example of that, but not ready to accept it in regard to the mind that you need some different causal way of looking at it than antecedent factors. And the, I think the basic reason they're not willing to accept that is they think the mind is supernatural. So we get rid of God, and we get rid of ghosts, and we get rid of poltergeist, and we get rid of a mind that chooses, because that's all of it, one phenomenon. So they can't escape their materialism, and and yeah. if they if they let free will in, they feel like they've accepted the idealism or they've accepted religion, and this is why it's particularly yeah. prevalent among the the new atheists. This view, yes. they're afraid yes. that they, they're, they're somehow conceding by accepting free will. Yeah. But yeah, and that, that again, I mean, that's Kant, and it's the way in which, I mean, Ayn Rand insists that philosophy is in control of all kinds of events and debates, even when people don't know it. And this is a good example. It's Kant defined your basic choice, and they, many people won't even know that Kant defined this, and this is how, but that's what they see, see themselves as choosing between, and I've got to resist the religious supernatural stuff, so I guess i got to resist, and it's, that's the, the power that philosophy has over people, um, because it defines the basic categories and choices and, and options, and then people operate within that. So you're not saying, though, that, that free will is somehow equivalent to, to, to the quantum phenomena. You're just using the quantum phenomena as another example where it's not the Newtonian form of materialistic causality. Well, it, it's materialistic, probably, yes. but it, I mean, material is a undefined and vague term used in these debates. But if, if you take it, 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 philosophically, it means something like external to consciousness, that which consciousness is aware of yep. in the primary sense, in the secondary sense, consciousness, at least the human consciousness is aware of itself, but it's the external, um, but but science means something more by that when it talks about material. And I think it's still an open question of how precisely to understand the quantum level. No, my point is they're willing to treat the quantum level as not deterministic. Yeah. So the issue really isn't everything's deterministic. And the problem with free will is it, you're saying it's not deterministic because they're happy in science. And they, and they will go bend over backwards to tell you how powerful quantum mechanics is and what we're able to do with it. So, and it's not deterministic. So it's that's not really in the end the issue. The issue is if I accept free will, I'm accepting the supernatural. Yeah. And that's what I'm unwilling to do. And that, that objectivism says 
yes, there are some accounts of free will. Like if you think it's implanted from God and so on, that are supernatural, but you don't have to have an account of free will that is supernaturalistic. Um, and object so objective account is a mind has a fundamental control over itself. And this is what is difficult in the conceptualization of it. When you start thinking about choices, you usually start thinking about the antecedent things that lead to it, the choice. And then it starts to look like, well, so aren't those factors then what's determining what you do? So if you think um, you're sitting in a restaurant and you're ordering dinner and, I don't know, you order a salad. And then if you ask, like, so why did you choose a salad? Well, I mean, my doctor told me I really need to lose weight. I'm on the road all the time, so I'm not eating that well. So here's this salad sounds good. Here's an opportunity to stick to my diet. So that's what I'm doing. So it's well, isn't it then all those antecedent considerations that are determining your choice? And what would free will be? The power to say to hell with all my reasons. I'm doing what I want. So it starts to look both weird and irrational. And that this also, if if it's someone who's thinking I'm scientific, rational, logical, what free will seems to be is the power to define my reasons. And what the hell is that for? Um, and what what uh, Ayn Rand does that I think is very distinctive in regard to free will is she says, yes, you do have choice when you sit at dinner. You have a choice between what you're going to order, and yeah, I mean you have a lot of choices. But that's not the fundamental choice that you have. So part of what is difficult in conceptualizing free will is figuring out what is the root choice. Um, Objective will often put it, what's the locus of choice? Or another way to put it, what's the primary choice? And if the primary choice is a choice over content, I'm going to order uh, the steak or a salad. I'm going to wear a blue shirt or a green shirt today. If that's the primary or fundamental choice, it's why are you doing it? Like why blue instead of green? And it seems to be like the, uh, the indeterminism. I mean, the way it would put, it's similar to quantum mechanics in the debate today. The way it was put in the ancient world, it's called the Epicurean swerve. And it's, they had a kind of atomist materialist view. And it's, why do you do one or the other? Well, sometimes an atom just swerves, yeah. and it and, and there's no explanation for it. And there's something right about at the primary choice. There's no explanation in the sense. Give me something antecedent that produced it. It's not a choice if something determined it. So at some point in free will, you have to say that's because the person did it. It just happened. It doesn't have antecedents that explain it. And if it's about content, people start to look irrational. Like it's, I don't know, I was in the restaurant and I decided to order a soup and that's all I was going to eat. And that, well, because something swerved and that's what happened. And it notice Harris is like, it's inexplicable what I do. Free will starts to look like that. And what objectivism says is the primary choice is not a choice about content. So it's not about a choice of actions. It's not even a choice about what ideas I'm going to accept. It's a choice about the activity your mind engages in, the processes your mind engages in or doesn't engage in. So that we're self-determining for objectivism means in the primary sense, we determine the course of action that our mind engages in. And, and we start to get this power as we go from an infant to starting to learn language and abstract and have a conceptual mind, we can use words, we can talk, you start to have a fundamental power over your mind. And it's a power of, am I orienting my mind towards the world, towards reality, towards the facts, and trying to the best of my ability and resources to grasp what's out there. And I have that fundamental control over my mind and it's the processing and it's all late their choices but they're later choices about okay well what am i going to think about how am i going to try to tackle it if i'm a kid 
I'm building a tower of blocks that falls down. Okay, well, how am I going to try to build it in a better way so it doesn't fall down? It's you have all kinds of things about con specific content. You live in the world in a specific context with all kinds of things going on that you have to make choices about. Mm -hmm. But deeper than that is the, my tower of blocks fell down. Am I just going to start crying and sulking and, and hoping someone comes along and fixes it? Or am I going to engage my mind and say, okay, how can I do this better? What, what happened here? And that's the control you have. So it's a control over the activity and processing of your mind. And the way it's put in objectivism, you have the power to focus your mind or to leave it relatively unfocused or completely unfocused. And that's a very different account than the traditional account. And this is what I said earlier on, that what objectivism says is, even though the fact of free will is self-evident, to properly conceptualize it so that it doesn't look strange and irrational, that is difficult. Um, and that's what a theory of free will is about, how to conceptualize the phenomenon fully and in a non-contradictory way. And that's what the objectivist theory of free will is trying to do. Now, I've seen people try to explain even that materialistically by using quantum mechanics. So even that choice to focus or not is just, you know, the, the, the randomness of quantum mechanics. So at least that's, the you know, quantum mechanics today is explained as random. Uh -huh. so they explain human human free will or that choice to focus or not to focus as a random thing. How how would you answer? How do we answer that? Um, well, that it's so again. The primary evidence is that introspectively, it's not true. Yeah. Um, that it's not. Oh, I found myself focusing, or I found myself thinking, and I don't know why. So it's that is your basic choice. But they call it a basic choice is that you're aware of yourself making it. Yeah. It's not happens. So the the all these randomnesses stuff happens. What free will is and self determination is. I made something happen, and those are two very different things. Like stuff does happen in life. Yeah. Uh, a tree falls on your house. Like I wasn't expecting it. I didn't do anything. Stuff happens, but that's not what the experience of your own mind and the control you have over it is like. And but and then there's again from the other perspective. If, if that were true, then you have no control over your thinking, no ability to assess it, no ability to think if it's going off the rails to redirect it and so on. Why put any stock in the conclusions you reach? Why are they any better than what any, someone else would reach? Yeah. Um, and there's no answer to that. It, when at the conceptual level, if you don't have control over your mind such that you can say, I'm orienting it towards reality. I'm pursuing the truth. And therefore, I can trust my conclusions because I know that that's what I'm doing. If you don't have that power, then you don't have any perspective on your own mind that I can rely on it, that I should view the conclusions I've reached as true because I put in the effort to reach the truth. If that's all just happens, um, you, the, you, you're completely out of control. And notice that like Harris is trying to, to, to use him as a little bit of a punching bag. He's trying to persuade people. What are you doing when you're trying to persuade people? Yeah, no, I never understood that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're not trying to find some antecedent factor out there. If I, if I just arrange his room in such a way, he'll come to agree with me because the lights are a little different. So if you thought that, you would be like the nudge people. that or We're going to construct your environment such that we're going to push you towards the right. Um, and, I mean, all over in today's culture, people are determined. So there are people who think that, yeah. that that's how people reach their conclusions. If I just restructure their environment in a certain way, I can manipulate them. But Harris doesn't think that. Yeah. He's trying to actually persuade people. And that means they have control over their mind and they can think about it and say, yeah, you're absolutely right about this. Um, and it's not determined by antecedent facts. No, it's shocking to me the arguments people get about free. I mean, why are we arguing if if we really are deterministic? Mm -hmm. What's what's the point? And notice that that um, when you're dealing with other animals, the lower the animal, the less you argue with it. Yeah. 
So you don't, I mean, a snail on the ground or you're not going to move, get out of the way. You might with your dog. Do you think they, so there is a perspective on the higher animals that you think they might have some element of free will that, but you don't with a snail or a worm or a snake. And that's because you view it as, they don't have that control. So what's the point of it? So do you do you think that there is or there will there will be one day a scientific explanation for free will? Does that question even? Yes, but it, it depends what explanation yes. means. So if that means in antecedent factors, no. But in the same way, do I think there will be a deeper perspective on quantum mechanics? Yes. Yeah. But it's not going to be that it all of a sudden everything about quantum mechanics is not actually it's all an illusion or something like that. And the same with free will. It's yes, though. I mean, I think it's a fascinating area to study neuroscience and psychology, psychology and biology from the perspective of thinking how does free will operate in this whole realm? So, what power does it give an individual over his consciousness? What can he do as a result of it? How are we to understand human behavior as a result of this, but also where does free will come from? Yeah. What are the neurophysiological conditions that it requires? I mean, you can definitely be incapacitated, such, I mean, if you're in a coma, you don't have free will, or you don't have it anywhere. I mean, there's some people who supposedly have some hearing and things, but you don't have it anywhere as a normal person does. I mean, and there's all kinds of other things that well, can happen. All the, all the issues, I mean, Sam Harris brings up the idea of when people have tumors that dict in a sense dictate particular behavior or or the effect drugs have on our psychology which yes. which are all true and documented yeah. so so all of that sounds like interesting areas to look at yeah and it's again and i mean psychology has to grapple with this they would have to grapple with it in the law so you have a tumor that's impinging on the brain and it's resulting in different personalities and express is it has the person lost complete control is there now there's a, there's a sort of mitigating factor but he still has some control over his mind and its operations such that you can hold him responsible though you have to allow that he has a tumor that's yeah. doing there's and that i mean to legal responsibility can we hold him le and, and then morally how do you view such a person there's all kinds of real issues there that science should be investigating but their premise can't be free wills and illusion so we don't need to think anything about that, and we'll just look at the other factor. That's the wrong approach, and it's it it's impoverishing. So objectivism's view is not the idealism. It's everything's free will in the mind. Forget about all that other stuff. But either neither should you do. All, that's all there is. Tumors on the brain, and so on, and forget about free will and the fact of consciousness and the self control that a human consciousness has. You have to be trying to integrate those. And that's a very, very difficult, and it should be like, this is the frontier of science, I mean, one aspect of science, that's enormously exciting. Yeah, uh, yeah. But because they're locked in either materialism or idealism, it's not that, in, it's not nearly as interesting as it could be. And it so. strikes me the same thing, that that same thing is true of kind of the evolutionary psychology, that is, the whole idea of what, did, how did our brain evolve and what did it evolve to impact traits or to impact inclinations, however we want to define it, and the interaction of that with free will and what we have control over and what we might not have control over, all of that is just, it strikes me as fascinating and interesting, but it yeah, seems like it, most evolutionary psychologists kind of, compart even if they believe in free will, compartmentalize free will to the side and kind of just deal with the evolutionary stuff independent of the, of the of the free will and the missing out on what's interesting. And I think they bracket it partly because they don't know how to deal with it, but partly because they're materialist determinists in the end, but have some sense it can't be exactly right, yep. but that's what science is and that's what we do. But I definitely think the, the issue of integrating evolution into a full picture of the of a human being so that has to include physiologically and psychologically is an interesting um branch of science to be thinking of i think one has to be cautious about how much data do we actually have in this area and just if you when you look at um 
evolution when it's it's much more at the physiological level leave aside the psychology of and how much is changing in the picture of how human beings evolve because they make new fossil discoveries and so on and it that's already really complicated to figure out how the the psychology is being is evolving is, and is affected by physiological structures and so on. that I, mean, I think it's way harder to get data about that and it's even more complicated than an already very complicated and changing field. So the, I think there's way too much overconfidence uh, and and even is it even science in evolutionary psychology um, where they're telling stories that sound good. But if you ask, where is the data for this, you're surprised by how little data there is. Yeah. And it, it strikes me that we understand scientifically, we understand something like life or consciousness. I mean, we have so little understanding of what constitutes life from a biological perspective or consciousness that, you know, and then human consciousness. I mean, that's just that's just so much even more that, yeah, the whole that whole science is still the whole science of biology is young. Yeah. Well, what do you mean by we have so so I definitely think we have not that much knowledge about consciousness yet. So stuff is known. Yeah. There is some known. In but what do you mean in regard to life? But even life, you know, what constitutes life, you know, from a biological or from a physical scientific perspective, we don't know how to create life yet. We can't create it in a tube. We don't know what level of complexity, what kind of complexity, what is it that makes life, makes inanimate atoms combine in a way as uh, to create yeah. something that is life. Uh, and I don't think the scientists really have a full grasp of that. I think they're getting closer and there's a lot of stuff, interesting things going on. But, and then to leap to that, to, to people expect us to have a complete rundown, a complete understanding of every everything that's involved in human consciousness and free will and, and everything like that, to me is such a leap given where the science is. Um, yeah, and it, I mean, so bi biology is a wonderfully complex field, yeah. and part of what they're discovering is how much more complex life is and at the cellular level and the genetics of it than we may have first thought. And yeah, so there's definitely... There's so much to explore there. And then when you're starting to ask, like, how did this evolve? Yep. It's, well, what's the this? And we're still grappling with what the this is, like where we are now versus, okay, how did that evolve? And so it's, it's, it's a really complicated and it should be exciting, but one should be very cautious about what's the, the known versus the unknowns in then regard. To what, to what extent do you think that this confusion over free will that, that is responsible for the difficulty in conveying other philosophical concepts that are more, you know, that are, let's say, that are political or moral. To what extent is this a, you know, a fundamental issue that in some ways has to be resolved before we're ever going to get people to really get the, the further down the road, in a sense, concepts? I think it's one of the most fundamental issues in philosophy um, because it shapes the whole view of human nature and how you view yourself. Um, and most bad political and moral movements and theories are deterministic. So, and, and this is something Ayn Rand stressed, that determinism and dictatorship go together. But deeper than the political, most attacks in morality on, on man and man's life and his ability to live are deterministic. And if you look at, at some of these social political movements, um, religion has attacked free will, uh, and in many different ways. So some are straight out determinists. Uh, when you look at some of the Protestants who set up dictator, like Calvin setting up dicta the sure. dictatorships in Geneva, it's predestination. It's you're the chosen or the damned. You don't know and you can't do anything about it. Um, 
and we somehow have some kind of direct line to the supernatural and we know something more than you do so we can put you in your place the that whole picture of people as determined as hemmed in physiologically or in some other way and not possessing a reasoning choosing mind is central and it comes the philosophy is uh, a battle between Plato and Aristotle. Ayn Rand is on Aristotle in the Aristotelian tradition, in a, understood in a broad sense. And Plato, even though I, he's better than many of the people who followed him, is on the side of, of denying human beings freedom and morality. But if you get, like in the Republic, it's people are, there's people who are, I mean, as we would make, put it now, commoners, people who should be soldiers, workers. There's a very select few, the philosopher kings, who can really exercise reason. But what that means in objectivist terms is who can really use their minds and are in control of their minds. Everybody else is in controlled by, so they're more controlled by their emotions or passions. And the philosopher king is going to set up everything so the system works as best it can. So, but it's a blueprint for, deter uh, for dictatorship. Uh, here it's philosophers. In, I mean, that's what's funny about it. But it's philosophers in charge. But it's a and it's because of viewing human beings as determined and teaching people that you should view yourself like that. Like view yourself as just a soldier. That's all you can aspire to. That's all you can be. And that runs throughout human history. Um, most cultures, other than the West have these kinds of assigned places. Mm -hmm. And when the West absorbed all kinds of, I mean, religion really comes from outside the West. It's a more an oriental perspective on the world. Um, when that dominated with Christianity, then people didn't view themselves as, I'm in control, I can chart my course. And the scientific revolution was demonstrating at the level of thinking you can do this, and every everybody can learn Newtonian physics yeah. if you really study it, look at the data, learn to reason. And then it became more not just about thought, but about action. You have fundamental control over your mind. You have a fundamental control over your life, therefore. And everybody can do this. And so what the Enlightenment is, why it's so optimistic, is because it views everybody as having free will and the power to reason and the power to choose to exercise it, regardless of where you were born and what country and what race and what level of income, you have this fundamental control over your life. And it's why the Enlightenment produced it, it comes out of the scientific worldview. But in early in the Enlightenment, it's on the side of free will. And someone like Locke, who's a central figure here. He's squarely on the side of free will and in a good, in a very good way that you have some kind of control over your mind, you can relinquish that. Yep. And that's what the people who submit to religion, to enthusiasm, which means your emotions taken over, you can relinquish it, but you can keep it too. And if you do that, you can be on a path to enlightenment in a fundamental way. And the whole American system of government relies on viewing each individual as capable of doing this. This is why you can be self-governing, because you're self-determining in a fundamental way. So it, this issue shapes your view of yourself, of mankind, and of society in a very deep way. And the movements that came after the Enlightenment, Marxism, for instance, yeah. um, and the same is true of Nazism, are deterministic. And through, Marx is through and through deterministic. And don't think you have control over your mind. And don't think ideas come from thinking. They come from economic forces outside you. And and they're and um, uh, I mean, we, you've been talking. Yeah. It, now we have identity politics, which is you know it comes from your group, or your ethnic group, your your economic strata. But it's not even the Marxist old Marxist economic strata. Now it really is back to the genes. It's it's. Mm -hmm. Back to the racial, you know, and the same. I mean, you've been arguing uh, uh, about the inequality issue, yeah, yeah. and that comes from the egalitarianism. And it's you didn't build that, and you didn't earn that. In the deepest sense, 
what they push is you don't have free will. That is so. Don't think you're responsible. It's your environment. It took a village to build that. It takes society. It's you're a product. You're not self-determining because you're not in control. And all the egalitarians, in one way or another, are on the side of determinism. But de as we've talked about, determinism is the widespread viewpoint. And even the people who think themselves on the side of morality, of freedom, and I would put like someone like a Sam Harris like that, yeah. is actually on the other side because he's undercutting himself in such a fundamental way by being in the determinist camp. <clears throat> so it's a, it's a crucial issue today um, that we've gone all wrong on it. And are there any philosophers out there who are advocates? I mean, because I... I've watched Dennett a little bit, or even Searle, who are some of the better people, and none of them have a, a even a close to right conception of free will. Yeah, I don't, um, I, so I'm not sort of up to speed in the c contemporary, which means like the last 10, 15 years of what is going on. When I was still in graduate school, I mean, there are some people who will talk in a better way about free will, but not anyone very prominent um that i in the field i think yeah. and part of what's happened in philosophy too it's disintegrated so th there's not um people who really have philosophies anymore they have views on particular issues so you might find someone who's good on free will but it doesn't integrate into any kind of world view really um and it's i mean we've talked about this it's similar in economics that you don't have any real theoreticians who are advancing a wide theory. They have on particular issues about trade or about monetary policy, but they don't have an, a wide view of the field and, and theories in it. And the same is true of philosophy today. It's much worse in philosophy because that's what philosophy is supposed to do. Um, so, so even if you can find better people, it's not, you're not getting a better world view that's integrating free will into it in a, in, a, in a fundamental. I mean, that is what Ayn Rand does, I think. Um, and she's unique in that in the 20th century because she takes, she's a system builder mm -hmm. in a way a philosopher should be. She takes the issue of free will as really important, has something new to say, and integrates it into a system. Um, and that, I mean, it's one of the reasons people should read Ayn Rand, even if they end up disagreeing with it some or all of what she said because this is this is a really important issue and it and it you know just to circle back to kind of where we started it's it's you know they 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 really can't think out of these two boxes that they put themselves into and uh, what i mean it offers is a completely different world view and and so many people resist resist um, resist reading her at their own peril and it, it really is a shame because uh, it, 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 it's fresh, it's new, it's exciting. And even if you disagree with it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to push the envelope. It's going to cause you to challenge your beliefs. Yeah. And they don't know, even if they come and read it, they don't know how to approach it. So even if you read something by Ayn Rand and you're put off by some particular political view yeah. or something she says in morality, um, Treat that as a detail. There's a whole perspective here from where she's coming. And think about that perspective and that she she's, has something very new to say about free will. And you might disagree with some of the details or some of the applications she makes of it. But if you're really interested in getting different world views, and I think one should be, because this is part of how an ordinary person who's not a genius, who can't formulate their own view, how you get out of these boxes that the culture pushes you is to read more widely, to read things outside of your contemporary framework, to get, oh well, yeah, there are other ways of looking at the world. Yeah. Um, and that is what Ayn Rand offers, and it's tremendously valuable, even if you don't come to agree with it. Yeah, we should do a session on how to approach reading Ayn Rand, something like what the companion, the companion to Ayn Rand uh, uh, is doing, but uh -huh. yeah, we should we should do that. That would be uh, that would be good. All right. Thanks, Ankar. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to say about free will that we haven't covered? Well, yeah, I mean, I think the 
one last issue, which we can just touch on that, but is worth stressing. Um, we've talked about free will more from what Ayn Rand would call, and, and philosophically you would put as the epistemological side, the side that you have over your thinking, and that you can orient yourself towards reality, towards the truth, and that you, you view yourself as having that power, and you view other people as having that. That's why you try to argue and persuade with them. Uh, from Ayn Rand's perspective, epistemology and morality, good and evil, right and wrong, go together. And she thinks the primary choice is both an epistemological choice about your thinking and the taking control of your mind, but it's also the primary moral choice. That, so one way to look at it is morality is about a dedication to the truth. And, and that's putting it in that wide uh, frame is not unique to objectivism, but objectivism agrees with that, that a morality in a deep sense is about the pursuit of truth um, and then acting accordingly. Yeah. But what it says is the reason morality is about that is because that's your fundamental choice. This is your primary choice, that you have this power. Um, and all there is to say about someone is he exercised that power or he chose not to. And you don't explain it by, well, his mother was mean to him. And so it's this is the fundamental control he has. And therefore, this when you morally look at yourself and others, this is the standard by which you assess yourself. So reason and morality or rationality and morality go, they're intricately interconnected for objectives. And it's because of its account of free will that it applies in both areas. And it's the same issue looked at from different perspectives. Um, and that again, so this, this is what it means to have a view of free will that's then integrated into a whole philosophy. Um, and it, and so it's a very interesting perspective on morality. Yeah, no, that would, be, that would make another great session is just is to is to cover that. Great. Thanks, Arka. Sure. Uh,